Okay, so we're going to go into another deepish dive question that has to do with sleep. Kathleen says, hi, Rhonda. Thank you for your recent aliquot where you updated us on your nutrition diet blueprint and your updated supplement regimen. You didn't say anything about nighttime supplements for sleep. Do you have a supplement stack you take for sleep? And what do you think about Andrew Huberman's supplement stack for sleep? Thank you so much. Okay, so the first part of this question, um, do you have a supplement stack you take for sleep? I do not. Um, I I used to take melatonin for my night terrors, but I have stopped taking it and my night terrors have really um, not come back any more than they were with melatonin, so I didn't feel like I really needed it. Um, my sleep stack is essentially a sauna or a hot tub two to three hours before I go to bed. And that's it. That's all I need. Um, there's there's no other supplements that I take or, you know, uh, there, there's not there's nothing that has convinced me that well, that's going to be more effective than actual heat stress. Um, and I did put out a video. You guys saw probably how how heat stress um, from the sauna or hot tub affects particularly slow wave sleep, but even sleep in general. So if you guys haven't seen that, check it out. It's a really short 10-minute video. So let's talk a little bit about um, sleep stack from um, Dr. Huberman, which, by the way, I have no problem with. So it's 145 milligrams of magnesium threonate or 200 milligrams of magnesium bisglycinate, 500 milligrams of apigenin, 100 to 400 milligrams of theanine, and then three to four nights a week, there's some glycine and, and GABA. Um, I did talk about some of this in a previous Q&A, Q&A number 29, but I'll go ahead and sort of recap. The magnesium threonate for sleep, um, there's been two clinical trials looking at sleep with magnesium threonate. The daily dose was about 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams, so quite high. Um, it was a 12-week sleep-focused trial. They were both of these were um, industry interest, industry led. So um, the company that made uh, magnesium three and eight was sponsoring the study, which you know there's a potential conflict of interest there, right? And there's also one animal study again that was also industry led as well. Um, so there's really just limited evidence that magnesium three and eight reaches the brain and it affects you know affects the brain really improves and it has any effect on cognitive tests we've talked about this in the past you know the one study that's shown it had to pull all the tests together to get statistical significance maybe it's just they the, the study was underpowered i think that's a, a big possibility but they did kind of manipulate the data a little bit to kind of make it um seem like it affect cognitive tests which again it, it just may be that there's a lack of evidence that studies are underpowered. I think, you know, there's there's a potential strong placebo effect as well. Um, I, I don't think there's enough evidence to support that magnesium 3 and 8 is effective at improving sleep. Uh, I do think that magnesium 3 and 8 is a good source of magnesium. 40% of the population has inadequate magnesium intake. I, so therefore, it could be the source that you use. I take magnesium glyc uh, glycinate. But if you're wanting to take magnesium 3 and 8, I think that's fine. Um, you know, making sure you don't have any uh, negative gut effects, of course, when you get like up to those 1,500, 2,000 milligram doses is one potential um, concern. But um, I don't really see any problem with taking it. But again, just strictly looking at the evidence in a very scientific, you know, way, I would say it's, 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 it's not really supported by evidence yet. It's still kind of we need more evidence to really uh, make a statement that magnesium 3 and 8 will improve sleep. That doesn't mean that it doesn't. It just means we don't have all the evidence to suggest it does. So apigenin, apigenin um, so that's something that is found in um, chamomile tea. There's really scarce data on apigenin's effects on improving sleep. Uh, there's really no clinical studies directly evaluating apigenin. Um, it's mostly looking at like chamomile tea. Uh, there was a cross-sectional study that was done in Italian adults looking at a diet rich in apigenin, and they did have um, 
you know, better sleep quality, but it, this is like, a, there's like a ton of confounding factors there. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, there, what, there have been some small clinical trials looking at chamomile, which again contains apigenin, um, and it was shown to be moderately effective in improving subjective sleep uh, compared to placebo. So in other words, the people taking it felt like their sleep was improved. Um, there's just no, there's like lack of evidence on actual apigenin supplements. So um, potential, you know, I, you know, could the chamomile tea, is it the hot liquid that plays a role in improving sleep because it was the tea study that showed them? We don't know, right? Like there's other things in the chamomile tea and, uh, you know, so I would say there's not strong evidence supporting a supplement for apigen and improving sleep, but I do think there could be some indication that chamomile tea could have a beneficial effect. Whether or not you can streamline everything down and narrow it and say, aha, it's the apigenin in, in the chamomile tea is up for debate because there's a lot of things going on there, right? It's hot tea and hot things also can have a, a sort of effect on helping with sleep and relaxation. Uh, and again, there's other compounds in chamomile as well. So um, again, just uh, I don't think it's harmful and I certainly, uh, you know, it, it seems pretty benign, but there's not a lot of strong science to support it yet. Uh, L-theanine, I say, is, pr is probably the one with the strongest evidence. So there was one phase two randomized controlled trial that showed improved sleep efficiency in boys with autism. There's been two phase uh, two tr randomized controlled trials showing um, improvement in subjective sleep quality in middle-aged adults with a daily intake of 200 to 900 milligrams of L-theanine. There was a small open label study, which doesn't have a placebo, so take it with a grain of salt, but also improved sleep quality in patients with depression and schizophrenia. Further large, fa um, larger phase three studies that are needed. I think um, they haven't been done yet, but they're needed to validate these studies. Um, I think the evidence for L-theanine, uh, its effectiveness in improving sleep is stronger than magnesium 3 and 8 and apigenin, as I mentioned. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problem with taking that sleep stack. Uh, that's sort of just a, a sort of in-depth breakdown of the science behind those particular supplements. Um, again, I think nothing is going to compare to heat stress when it comes to uh, improving sleep. I think the evidence is stronger, but um, you know, we just may not have enough high quality evidence out there to show that these compounds are doing much yet. Robson is asking, can magnesium 3 and 8 be taken on a long-term basis without adverse effects? Um, I, don't, I don't know that there's been any studies looking at really long-term high-dose magnesium. I think that you know, at a, at a relatively normal dose probably should be fine. But um, I think most of the magnesium 3 and 8 is staying in circulation. Um, you know, it, it, it's... it's, it's 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 up for debate on how much really gets into the brain in humans. So so that's, you know, again, it's one of those things where we just we just don't have the evidence. And I do think that magnesium 3 and 8 is a fine source of magnesium. Um, I, I supplement with about 130 milligrams of ma uh, magnesium glycinate. But um, I think, you know, if you want to take magnesium 3 and 8, I think that's that's fine. Mostly you just want to avoid magnesium oxide. Um, Matt is saying that Dr. Huberman also recommends myo-inositol, GABA, and glycine for sleep. Um, I haven't looked in depth for sleep. I'll say GABA does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So, um, you know, it's interesting. Like maybe there's a potential effect on the gut microbiome. Um, through the vagal nerve because GABA can can um, have an effect on enteric neurons in the gut. Um, and this could then stimulate the vagal nerve and communicate to the brain for like a sort of relax, um, you know, sort of effect. But um, yeah, I, I didn't look into depth into those for sleep. So that could be something for next time if someone wants to submit that question. Um, Bill says, why should we avoid magnesium oxide uh, or dioxide it's just not very bioavailable it's like it's it's that's the one it's the one form of magnesium that's just not bioavailable 
magnesium citrate, magnesium malate, magnesium glycate, magnesium bisglycate, magnesium th magnesium threonate. Um, they're all pretty bioavailable. So that I think those are all um, pretty reasonable choices for magnesium supplementation.